If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Who am I as someone called to love? What do I need to know as someone called to love? And what do I need to do as someone called to love? And those are the three prongs, or the, the three legs of the stool upon which this program sits. Part of my role is to evangelize, and yet I find that I've been evangelized by them. It's really beautiful to watch how they can put love into action in just really simple, basic ways. If it's cooking a meal, they've cooked breakfast, or cleaning up after an activity, or if it's something bigger like helping to build a house for Habitat for Humanity. This program has taught me that God has gifted me in specific ways and that I can use those gifts that I already possess to serve others and the community um, by just being who I am. Leading with love is all about leading to help others. It's not about you. You're giving of your full self to others to benefit them, which in turn gives you the grace and the faith you need to keep on doing it. Leading can, just leading by itself without love, can be cold. It can bring you distance from the people you're working with. It can bring you to making decisions without thinking about the effects on others and the effect on this world. But leading with love, brings compassion, brings hope to what you're doing. I'd like to uh, echo Dr. Demore's invitation. Uh, after this, after the presentation, Dr. Mannion is going to take some questions, uh, and then after the presentation and the questions, they're uh, across um, to the next building uh, in our uh, Moore Center, our newly re uh, renovated Moore Center, is uh, a reception. Uh, I'd like to offer a special invitation to those of you who haven't yet. Uh, been to the newly renovated Moore Center. We're very proud of it. So please come and uh, uh, look at all the hard work that we've put into this over the past couple of years. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Mania's presentation this evening is called Pope Francis Envision Envisioning a Social Revolution Driven by Love. Dr. Gerard Mannion is the Joseph and Winifred Amaturo Chair in Catholic Studies in the Theology Department at Georgetown University and a Senior Research Fellow at the Berkeley Center where his work focuses on the role of the church in the world, on social ethics, and on ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. Dr. Mannion has published widely in the fields of ecclesiology, ethics, and public theology as well as in other fields of systematic theology and philosophy. He is the founding chair of the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network. His numerous books include 
Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism, Evangelii e Gaudium and the Papal Agenda, which was published this past year, 2017, and was the impetus for uh, our invitation to him for this evening. He's also published Where We Dwell in Common, Path Pathways for Dialogue in the 21st Century, The Rutledge Companion to the Christian Church, Catholic Social Justice, Theological and Practical Explorations, Ecclesiology and Postmodernity, Questions for the Church in Our Times, and Schopenhauer, Religion and Modernity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerard Mannion. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, well, it's a true honor and a privilege to be here tonight and to be invited to share some thoughts with you about Pope Francis and his relentless commitment towards promoting social justice. I'm especially grateful to Professor Stuart Squires for his very gracious introduction, uh, but also for organizing this entire event and also to the Living and Leading with Love program and the Lilly Foundation for this invitation and the joint sponsors, Bishop William Medley of the Diocese of Owensboro and Farah Larry Hostetter, of course, the university's president. This is my very first visit to Owensboro and it was a delight to see along the riverfront and the recent additions to your civic quarter uh, this last day and a half. So thank you all very much indeed. So of course it's also my first visit to Brescia University. When Professor Squire's first email came through to me last year before I opened it, my brain at first assumed the email was from the Italian city of Brescia, which I had passed through many times some years ago, especially its airport, mostly its airport, when I was visiting uh, a visiting scholar in Trento in Italy. The Ursuline sisters, as you all know much better than I, of course, were founded in Brescia, and I've since learned that the link, that's the link to Owensboro, as the Ursuline sisters of Mount St. Joseph founded the original college that became the university in 1925. As another small connection, while I do not know the Italian city of Brescia as well as its airport, I am very familiar with Desenzano, which is the birthplace of Angela de Merici, the foundress, of course, of the order. It's a stunningly beautiful and charming small town on the shores of Lake Garda. So I do feel there were some connections here long before the visit was proposed. And also there's a connection with tonight's theme. Angela de Merici's life spanned one of the most dramatic periods of upheaval and change in European history, and especially in the history of the church. It was the period of the Great Renaissance, of course, which transformed education, culture, and politics. Not least of all, an era when the education of girls was seen as a much needed priority, hence the founding of the order. But it was also, of course, the period of the Reformation era in the church during part of her life. St. Angela died a few years before the Council of Trent began the formal responses of Catholicism to other people, but orders such as the Ursulines would prove crucial to the future of the Catholic Church as education and other priorities were carried forward and the church reformed itself internally in many ways thanks to those new orders. It was also a period of profound social revolution in multiple ways. Finally, St. Angela had also been a member, before she founded her order, of the Third Order of St. Francis of Assisi, and she adopted much of the spirit and charism of the Franciscans for her own order's founding vision. The Franciscan charism, of course, is one dedicated to serving, above all else, the poor and valuing all of creation, towards building a more just society through putting the gospel into practice. So the subject talk of the talk tonight is another servant of the church who more recently has taken the inspiration of St. Francis's vision and set about applying it to their own contemporary era. So a church oven for the poor, Pope Francis, and joined up social ethics. From the very outset, Pope Francis made his top priority an unswerving commitment to justice for the poor and wider questions of social justice, both his own and the church's key yeah. priority. And this helps point towards one of the most important formative influences upon his own vision and understanding of the church of all, namely the vision for the church outlined in the many contributions from the Latin American liberation theology. In fact, the key reason why he chose the name of Francis was because after he had been elected at the conclave in Rome, his friend, the Brazilian Cardinal Claudio Humes, congratulated and embraced him, but at the same time whispered to him don't forget the poor. Pope Francis said that this was the moment he knew to choose the inspiring name of St. Francis of Assisi, 
who himself had worked so hard to help serve the poor, and who adopted voluntary poverty for himself and his fellow lesser brothers in the new religious community founded in Assisi back in the 13th century. Jorge Bergoglio brought with him to Rome many of the priorities he had in his earlier ministry, and especially his experience as the Bishop of the Slums, as they called him, when he worked among some of the poorest back in Argentina. Pope Francis's agenda is also reflective of the collective agenda of the bishops of Latin America, particularly their document from Aparecida, the meeting at the, of that region's bishops in 2007, the final document of which Bergoglio was very influential in drafting. Time and again, social justice and the option for the poor featured as the core focus of the writings and interviews from Bergoglio when he was a bishop in Argentina. So this is a crucial area of consistency between his episcopal ministry prior to his election and now his papacy as universal pastor of the Catholic Church. Perhaps more than any of his recent predecessors, Pope Francis has firmly wedded the church's overall mission to its social mission. His choice of name, of course, on election already signals so much about his pontifical priorities. And when asked about such er this early in his papacy, he immediately replied that he wanted a poor church for the poor. So a church of and for the poor lies at the heart of Francis's vision and for the church. A church that can be open to and embrace all, working for the liberation from all forms of oppression, marginalization and exclusion, the liberation of all. Everything else serves these priorities because the gospel has that priority itself. Francis has spoken of the need for the church to be one which goes forth. And this, of course, can only have multiple social consequences. He has also referred to the church as a field hospital and has recently reorganized the Vatican, placing at the center of its work a new super department, dicastery, that has the implementation of the church's social mission as its raison d'etre, the dicastery for integral human development. They used to call them congregations, but apparently Pope Francis, I'm told, doesn't like the word congregation to be used in that respect, so they're called dicasteries now. Church teaching, theology, and social justice are intertwined in his vision for the church, so intertwined as to be entirely inseparable. In many places, as we shall see, he has criticized individualism in the wider world and in the church alike. And his teaching documents and many statements and gestures to date have made clear that justice, equality, peace, openness and inclusion should be at the forefront of all the church's activities. Mercy has been a core watchword for this papacy and indeed as you recall in fall 2015 Francis officially opened a year of mercy for the whole church. So walking the walk as well as talking the talk in other words, Francis has also sought to lead very much by example. He has walked the walk, and here many striking examples can be pointed to, and there are more numerous, lesser known instances to sit alongside those that captured the media headlines around the globe. But some of the latter included, of course, one of the very first acts of his papacy, his shunning the trappings of office and even the grandiose papal apartments for two simple rooms in the Domus Santa Marta hostel. He removed the so-called German Bishop of Bling from his Limburg diocese because of protests at the enormous sums that had been spent on re refurbishing the bathroom of his living quarters. Around the globe at that moment, diocesan chanceries soon began to examine the quality of their shower fittings accordingly. In 2013, the first year of his papacy, Francis was given as a gift to Harley Davidson motorcycle and more recently last year a top of the range Lamborghini. In both cases these gifts were auctioned and the proceeds donated to serving the poor. He also auctioned the jacket that was given to him to accompany the Harley Davidson. The bike alone was sold for $327,000. Apparently that's about four times the normal value of such a bike. And when Pope Francis came to visit the United States in 2015 it was both endearing as well as comical to see the Pope Mobile, a tiny Fiat Uno, dwarfed by Secret Service Hummers everywhere the papal motorcade went. 
But of course, all of these signify something of so much more than endearing and comical value. They point towards a relentless and consistent commitment to his vision. They speak, they address the priorities and values of many societies today, and they present a challenge. Pope Francis is not afraid of challenging people, those within and beyond the church alike. He seeks to promote a rad radical inclusivity for the poor and the marginalized. And among the deep-seated challenges beyond those headline-grabbing examples just mentioned, we can point to how Francis had offered a now famous injunction to bishops and priests alike to get out and become more familiar with, to use his words, the smell of the sheep. Examples also include his famous washing of the feet of young offenders at a correctional institute, including those of a young Muslim woman, and visits to such institutions since, including in 2016 in Mexico, where he told the prisoners they could go out into the world and be prophets once free. He has embraced the sick and shared his birthday breakfast with the homeless. He has taken lunch with the workers in the Vatican canteen. He has engaged refugees, making a special gesture towards Muslims among their number when he visited the refugee island Lampedusa, the first of many acts that demonstrated his profound commitment to the plight of migrants and refugees, not least of all that demonstrated again when he visited the United States in September 2015. He became the first pope to address both houses of Congress and rhetorically said to them that surely we all want for our own children what most migrants simply want for theirs, a better future, as well as remarking on his own origins as the child of migrants, just as most of the people of the Americas owe their existence to migration. When he visited Mexico in February 2016, he again addressed these issues head on, celebrating mass close to the border and responding on his plane journey home when a journalist told him of Donald Trump's proposals to build a wall the length of the border, that a person who advocated such views was not a Christian. Then there are his calls for an end to racial and religious discrimination and persecution. His reaching out to the homeless again and the poor continued at the Vatican itself. To begin, they provided showers and a barber hairdresser facilities and eventually a fully fledged shelter right in the site of St. Peter's. His preference when visiting Washington DC back in 2015 was to share lunch with the homeless in downtown DC rather than the elected power brokers of Congress whose invitation he politely declined. We have seen his genuinely moving outreach to those with disabilities, his multiple statements about the need for women in the church to enjoy greater involvement in the decision-making processes of the church and for their work on its behalf to be better appreciated. His vision of an inclusive church was also indicated by his now famous statements of compassion to gay people, to quote, if someone is gay and is searching for the Lord and has good will, then who am I to judge? Then there are his statements and actions about the roles and responsibilities of women in and for the church, to the range and breadth of background among the people invited to participate in the 2015 Synod on the Family, alongside his inclusion of voices from around the world including from smaller and less influential countries in the College of Cardinals and the departments of the Roman Curia. Pictures of him embracing the handicapped and individuals suffering from particular afflictions, to his meetings with abuse victims and his marrying at the Vatican, couples who had previously been living together and who had already had children, spoke further volumes about his pastoral priorities and the character of his application of the church's teaching his vision for putting the gospel into practice. All of this demonstrates then that Francis is very serious indeed about implementing a vision for the church, an ecclesiology that is of radical openness, that he is very serious indeed about walking the walk as well as talking the talk. So let me say a little bit more about this radical vision centered on Caritas. For Francis, a social revolution lies at the very heart of the gospel. Building on a statement in his earliest major teaching document, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he said that at the heart of the gospel there lies a moral 
a social and moral message centered on charity, on caritas, on love. Francis consistently speaks out against the dehumanizing forces of global capitalism, as we shall see. In thinking, again clearly informed by his Latin American background and context, he has called for an end to the cult of money, and he tells the world that money has to serve, not rule. He has dismissed the throwaway culture of our times. This commitment to the poor, to social justice, again lies at the heart of Pope Francis's vision of the church in general, and everything else serves that priority because the gospel has that priority itself. Again, in Evangelii Gaudium, he speaks not only of Jesus as the evangelizer par excellence, but he also speaks of the first proclamation of the gospel. This was in terms of Jesus' great commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel, 28-20. For Francis, this is not primarily something that should be understood as being about doctrinal observation at all, to use his terms, but rather it's concerned with deeper existential and practical outcomes. Not least of all the fact, to quote, that the kerygma has a clear social content. At the very heart of the Gospel is life and community and engagement with others. The content of the first proclamation has an immediate moral implication centered on charity, on caritas. So Francis in that early document also speaks of the challenges amidst the crisis of communal commitments in the world. He knows that this is a vision that is difficult for many people today. He explores the financial crises, the crises of ideologies, cultural crises, crises of identity, of commitment, community, again and again. His exhortation included a very significant section on including the poor fully in society. He even spoke of the piety of the poor as a loco theologicus, in other words, as an inspiration to and primary source and norm for theological reflection itself. And yet there's also social and ecclesiological realism that characterizes his vision. So it's not about idealism or unrealistic visions for how the world can be made a bit of place. In fact, in all Pope Francis does, there's a refreshing realism charged by pastoral and social concern above all else. He does not hold an idealist view of a pure church free of blemishes, far from it. He is refreshing in acknowledging just how much of a mess the church is in, including especially its central offices and leadership. Indeed, Francis has been astonishingly frank in his admittance and assessment of the church's own moral and social failings, both throughout history and in our own times. There's no pretense that somehow the church itself and the messy, fallible humans who constitute its people can somehow be separated. He knows drastic structural and existential change is necessary, and he has set about implementing this. And this again is something that he brought with him from the lessons learned during his Episcopal ministry in Argentina, where he had to reform the archdiocese at every level. In one of the most evocative passages from Evangelii Gaudium that was quickly cited around the globe and captured the attention of so many soon after the exhortation's release, we see something that is among the most suggestive of his vision of the church and most suggestive of his priorities of all. And here he makes his priorities as clear as possible, and I quote, here I repeat for the entire church what I have often said to the priests and laity of Buenos Aires. I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. I do not want a church concerned with being at the centre and which then ends by being caught up in a web of obsessions and procedures more than by fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within structures which give us a false sense of security, within rules which make us harsh judges, within habits which make us feel safe, while at our door people are starving, and Jesus does not tire of saying to us, give them something to eat. Mark 6.37 So these words too encapsulate the vision of the church, the ecclesiological and indeed social revolution that Francis wished to commence in multiple ways 
relatively early on in his papacy. So if Francis is offering us joined up social ethics, this also means joined up social praxis. In more recent writings, Francis has gone on to further great lengths to offer more joined up thinking on issues of social justice. His social teaching offers a powerfully holistic and intertwined social vision in an intentional fashion. This joined up social thinking then is aimed, only exists, is only entered into because it wants to promote joined up social praxis. Francis has an innovation in promoting what he calls an integral approach to social issues. And this is especially demonstrated by his great commitment to ecology and care for the environment, particularly in his groundbreaking encyclical of June 2015, Laudato Si, which takes its title from the opening words of St. Francis of Assisi's famous and enchanting canticle of creation. This makes clear that care for the earth, our common home, to cite the encyclical's subtitle, cannot be divorced from care for the poor and marginalised, nor from upholding and protecting human dignity, nor from the quest for peace and the banishment of weapons of mass destruction, including especially nuclear weapons. All are linked for Francis in the quest for the common good. It is thus that Laudato Si seeks to offer what he calls an integrated ecology. Nothing in this world, he says, is indifferent to us. The urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern, he says, to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development. For we know that things can change. The Creator does not abandon us. He never forsakes his loving plan or repents of having created us. Humanity, he says, still has the ability to work together in building our common home. And he goes on to outline that vision further. An integral ecology is inseparable, he says, from the notion of the common good, a central and unifying principle of social ethics. His encyclical, therefore, tackles the pressing challenges of today, including not simply ecological issues. It would be a great mistake to think the encyclical is just about the environment, but also the causes of the breakdown in social and community life, such as rampant global inequality, consumerization, the need for the fairer distribution and common utilization of goods, and the need for justice, he says, across generations. And again, he has been consistent. A further example of his holistic and integral vision can be seen with regard to his ongoing and increasingly vocal commitments on the issue of migration and refugees. We have witnessed so many statements and gestures from those early ones I mentioned at the beginning onwards, where Francis has sought to have a profound effect on raising awareness around the world in relation to what is one of the 21st century's most pressing and urgent social challenges. His visits to many further migrant and refugee camps has helped impress upon the European Union, for example, the need for urgent legislation to oblige member nations to give greater assistance to those refugees who were seeking to enter Europe by its southernmost sea borders, countless numbers often perishing in the process, a crisis of course exacerbated by the ongoing war in Syria. Through leading by example, in his no-nonsense language on such issues, Pope Francis has literally helped save countless lives and has continued to be outspoken on the sins of omission with regard to such issues on the part of wealthy nations and individuals since. And of course, here we recall again that he himself comes from a family of migrants in a land of many migrants going back multiple generations. He speaks from experience. One further example of his holistic social vision is how he links the arms manufacturing industry to the prevalence of war and conflict around the globe denouncing those who make money from such an industry of death. And he shows that this in turn has knock-on effects upon social inequality, upon damage to the environment. He has consistently opposed war and violence, and most recently called calling for the unilateral abolition of nuclear weapons by all nations possessing them, in which the Vatican partnered with three sponsoring United, Nation nation, uh, United Nations member nations in calling together 
something like 140 different countries to sign a document calling for this. You can guess which countries did not sign that document. I'll leave it to you to work that one out. So to turn to my next section, Francis is a public theologian and also a political theologian. The church that goes forth must firmly engage with the world where the world is at and not from some distant or lofty position of perceived moral and social superiority. In that first major teaching document, which itself pointed towards what would be a recurring theme in its papacy today, the joy of the gospel, Francis demonstrated three clear things that spoke further volumes about his vision for the church and for social ethics. And all of these are fully intertwined. Again, first, the gospel exists to be put into practice. The faith is a gift that can and should literally change the world. Second, he offers a vision of the church that is open to that world, that is outward looking, not inward looking, and that is willing to engage in dialogue, to work with others, a church that excludes nobody from its compassion. And third, which follows from the first two, Francis envisions a church that teaches with authority, i.e. exercises magisterium, only for the sake of putting the gospel into practice in an open and dialogical fashion. This Pope's priority is pastoral care and the church's pastoral mission must come over and above doctrine and church structures and offices which only exist to serve the church's pastoral mission, including its social mission and not the other way around. Therefore, Francis does not want the church to spend its energies on doctrinal squabbles and theological divisions. Addressing multiple aspects of the crises for the church in recent times, he calls for a church that realises it must not become obsessed with doctrinal disputes and alienating lines in the sand. Rather, the gospel is about responding to the love of God in like kind. And one amusing story here is when some Pentecostal people visited him at the Vatican and they were talking about progress in ecumenical dialogue and theological discussions on this. The Pope said, we are already united. Of course, the theologians are important and we must let them continue their important work. But if we wait for them to agree, we will be waiting until the day after the eschaton, the apocalypse. Let us just continue to share the unity we already have because we know we are brothers and sisters in Christ already. In all this, Francis is conscious of the enormous good that the church can and must continue to do for the world in collaboration with others. He is relentless in his commitment to ecumenical and interfaith dialogue, to working with people from beyond particular faith communities, because he knows a great deal of good can be achieved through promoting such dialogue. So in many respects, and alongside the call for the church that goes forth, we might also say that many of his teaching documents, his statements, his actions to date, reflect components of a very public theology, an outward looking theology, indeed a political theology. By that I mean a theology that seeks to make a difference in the midst of the real world, with all of its messiness and failings. But it is a public theology shaped firmly by his background and ministry in Latin America. And so he addresses the church's public mission today in the following words. Despite the tide of secularism which has swept our societies in many countries, even those where Christians are a minority, the Catholic Church is considered a credible institution by public opinion and trusted for her solidarity and concern for those in greatest need. Again and again, the Church has acted as a mediator in finding solutions to problems affecting peace, social harmony, the land, the defense of life, human and civil rights, and so forth. And how much good has been done by Catholic schools and universities around the world? This is a good thing. Yet we find it difficult to make people see that when we raise other questions less palatable to public opinion, we are doing so out of fidelity to precisely the same convictions about human dignity and the common good. And so he offers four principles to ground his social ethical vision. Because like an earlier Pope, Pope John XXIII, who called the Second Vatican Council, Francis too has heeded the call to discern the signs of these times. 
He speaks of progress in building a people in peace, justice and fraternity, but this depends upon these principles that he identifies which are related to constant tensions present in every social reality, he says. He argues that they derive from the pillars of the church's social doctrine, which he says serve as primary and fundamental parameters of reference for interpreting and evaluating social phenomena. He continues, these four specific principles which can guide the development of life in society and the building of a people where differences are harmonized within a shared pursuit, their application can be a genuine path to peace within each nation and in the entire world. And what are those four principles? You'll probably have remembered their citation widely when he first issued this document. Time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas. The whole is greater than the part. In the subsequent years to date since writing those words in 2013, Francis would unpack these principles and ensure they would increasingly inform and shape policy and practice throughout the Vatican and the Universal Church worldwide. Time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas and the whole is greater than the part. The public and political dimensions of his vision are further indeed particularly demonstrated in how he has called for a radical overhaul of the prevailing political and economic systems in today's world. He has called for a change to both political and economic discourse and their agenda. He has called for a new global dialogue and solutions, collaboration, new political and international ways of tackling our most pressing social, economic and ecological problems. He has called for an end to short termism. He has spoken of the need for new models of progress and global development and against instrumental thinking and policies. He has said that economics without politics cannot be justified since this would make it impossible to favor other ways of handling the various aspects of the present crisis. But he has said we need a new type of politics in working in tandem with morally driven economic thinking and practice. And so we can say what he is offering is an uncompromising social ethics grounded on the gospel. Indeed, Pope Francis does not pull any punches when it comes to addressing these issues. His messages and teachings so far have been thoroughly uncompromising, especially on economic and political issues. For example, again in Evangelii Gaudium, he provides one of the most vivid illustrations of all this in a passage where he laments at how it could not be a new story that a homeless person dies on the streets and yet a two-point drop in the stock exchange somehow is deemed headline news. In this past week, when the stock markets have tumbled exponentially and grabbed all the media attention, his words challenge us all the more, as did the continuation of his exhortation back then when he said, this is a case of exclusion. Can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? This is a case of inequality. Today, everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the fittest, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized, without work, without possibilities, without any means of escape. In relation to this, Francis has frequently spoken about the globalization of indifference, and this memorable and jarring phrase has equally become one of the watchwords of the official church under this pontificate, and he has still further hard words for politicians in the world of business, calling for a complete reordering of their priorities towards the common good. He argues that and demonstrates how the 2008 financial crisis and the obsession with profit at all costs has proved destructive to our world in so many ways. He states, today in view of the common good, there is urgent need for politics and economics to enter into a frank dialogue in the service of life, especially human life. Saving banks at any cost, making the public pay the price, foregoing a firm commitment to reviewing and reforming the entire system, only reaffirms the absolute power of a financial system, a power which has no future and will only give rise 
to new crises after a slow, costly, and only apparent recovery. The financial crisis of 2007-8 provided an opportunity to develop a new economy more attentive to ethical principles and new ways of regulating speculative financial practices and virtual wealth. But the response to the crisis did not include rethinking the outdated criteria which continue to rule the world. This shows he is watching what is happening. He is implementing very pertinent analysis and taking wide advice from experts in various fields. He continues, the principle of the maximization of profits, frequently isolated from other considerations, reflects a misunderstanding of the very concept of the economy. As long as production is increased, little concern is given to whether it is at the cost of future resources or the health of the environment. As long as a clearing of a forest increases production, no one calculates the losses entailed in a desertification of the land, the harm that is done to biodiversity, or the increased pollution. In a word, businesses profit by calculating and paying only a fraction of the costs involved. This is in-depth, sharp economic and social analysis, but we do not see it on the discussion programs when the economy is talked about on our news items. Uh, I marveled at the beauty of the Riverfront Park uh, today and yesterday on arriving in Owensboro, and it is a truly beautiful vista to look at. But when I looked closer at the water, I thought I would not like to drink a glass of the water. And, uh, and I think those issues of profit dominating over the resources and the health of the community that Pope Francis addresses, uh, uh, we can all in our communities see them. You can see the very same when you look at the river, the Potomac in Washington, D.C. People in D.C. blame this on companies in Virginia, but uh, I think the reverse is also the case when people are asked in Virginia too. So Francis wants to point towards re-emphasizing the common good. Echoing that call for a new politics and economics, he speaks about the dignity of each human person and the common good, a concern which ought to shape all economic policies. And yet, it is irksome when the question of ethics is raised, when global solidarity is invoked, when the distribution of goods is mentioned, when reference is made to protecting labor and defending the dignity of the powerless, when allusion is made to a God who demands a commitment to justice. At other times, these issues are exploited by a rhetoric which cheapens them. And of course, many people, when Pope Francis speaks about economics, try to tell him that it's none of his business, that he should keep out of it, and that they don't seek economic advice from the Pope. He should stick to faith, to the gospel. They miss the point that this is what he's doing. It's because of the faith of the gospel that he's addressing economic questions for our times. And he again returns to the theme of the need to defeat individualism. We are always capable, he says, of going out of ourselves towards the other. Disinterested concern for others and the rejection of every form of self-centeredness and self-absorption are essential if we truly wish to care for our brothers and sisters and for the natural environment. These attitudes also attune us to the moral imperative of assessing the impact of our every action and personal decision on the world around us. If we can overcome individualism, he says, we will truly be able to develop a different lifestyle and bring about significant changes in society. It is thus that he speaks of the need to foster what he calls civic and political love. Civic and political love. Where do you hear the term political and love in the same sentence? We must regain the conviction, he says, that we need one another, that we have a shared responsibility for others in the world and that being good and decent are worth it. The conviction that we need one another, we have a shared responsibility for others in the world, and that being good and decent are worth it. And yet, it's not come without controversy, as I've already briefly mentioned. When Pope Francis ventures to speak about the poor, about the causes of poverty, about exclusion, about a throwaway culture and society, about the globalization of indifference and about the failings and evils of economic systems that lead to the vast inequalities that blight our world, indeed about social justice in general, he cannot fail to equally engage questions that demand political, social and economic analysis too. 
Therefore, these are teachings and statements that have proved the most controversial in his pontificate, particularly in some countries where capitalism almost holds the status of a religion, and there are many such countries. Indeed, Francis has been regularly pilloried by those of the political and religious, and in some cases, theological right. One commentator called the sections on social justice in Evangelii Gaudium downright Marxism. Others have called him a communist or accused him of preaching socialism. The type of things Francis has said which attracted sub opposition was in particular his denunciation of trickle-down economics. In particular in Evangelii Gaudium, section 54, where he's speaking about a culture of exclusion where economics is the source of such exclusion and so injustice. And so, Pope Francis states, in this context, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories, which assume that economic growth, encouraged by a free market, will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. It is thus that he goes on to denounce, in that phrase I mentioned earlier, the new idolatry of money. Remember, trickle-down economics is a relatively recent phenomenon. It is thus that he goes on to, uh, to denounce that. His words are uncomfortable for many who bury their heads of, of their own comfort, in the sand of their own comfort, individuals, societies, corporations, even churches and dioceses alike. It is very hard-hitting language that he employs to address today's key challenges. So to quote again, while the earnings of a minority are growing exponentially, so too is the gap separating the majority from the prosperity enjoyed by those happy few. And we must remember that never has there been greater wealth in the world concentrated in the hands of so few people. Never has there been greater inequality and poverty in the world. This imbalance is the result of ideologies, he continues, which defend the absolute autonomy of the marketplace and financial speculation. Consequently, they reject, and this is very pertinent in an age of new multinational and international trade agreements being spoken about. Consequently, they reject the right of states charged with vigilance for the common good to exercise any form of control. A new tyranny is thus born, invisible and often virtual, which unilaterally and relentlessly imposes its own laws and rules. Debt and the accumulation of interest also make it difficult for countries to realize the potential of their own economies and keep citizens from enjoying their real purchasing power. To all this we add widespread corruption and self-serving tax evasion, which have taken on worldwide dimensions. The first for power and possessions knows no limits. In this system, which tends to devour everything which stands in its way, the way of increased profits, whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interests of a deified market, which become the only rule. This hard-hitting language continues again and again when he addresses these issues. Alongside his denunciation of trickle-down economics, he has firmly criticized the dominant economic models that have been dictating political, economic, and social policies throughout most of the West since the late 1970s. He says, we can no longer trust in the unseen forces and the invisible hand of the market. Growth in justice requires more than economic growth. While presupposing such growth, it requires decisions, programs, mechanisms, and processes specifically geared to a better distribution of income, the creation of sources of employment, and an integral promotion of the poor, which goes beyond a simple welfare mentality. I am far from proposing, he knows people will criticize him in saying, well, this is unrealistic. He's saying, I am far from proposing an irresponsible populism that the economy can no longer turn to remedies that are a new poison, such as attempting to increase profits by reducing the workforce and thereby adding to the ranks of the excluded. He is equally un unambiguous in stating that the church must say no to a financial system which rules rather than serves, because, he says, behind such an attitude lurks a rejection of ethics and a rejection of God. He urges political leaders to a conversion, an ethically driven reform of financial systems and markets from top to bottom. 
He demands that we give all our effort to working towards the inclusion of the poor in society, stating that the word solidarity is a little worn and at times poorly understood, but it refers to something more than a few sporadic acts of generosity. It presumes the creation of a new mindset which thinks in terms of community and the priority of the life of all over the appropriation of goods by a few. Strangely, many Catholics of a politi uh, particular political, doctrinal, ecclesiological and political persuasion, who under recent popes would argue loudly that Catholics must obey the pope on everything and must follow the teachings coming out of Rome without exception, have morphed into something reminiscent of the cafeteria Catholics they once denounced. Some of these very same Catholics have gone into print, online, and in the broadcast media to essentially say that the Pope doesn't know what he's talking about on these issues, such as economics, politics, and even the environment. They also say they do so in ignorance of the wide consultations the Pope engages with in major experts around the world in these fields. They also say that Catholics are therefore not bound by what Pope Francis says on such issues, how times have changed indeed. Some Catholics have tried to water down the force of Pope Francis's message as well on social justice. For example, one prominent and here nameless US Cardinal rushed to the media after the release of Evangelii Gaudium to say that when the Pope criticized the capitalistic system for the harm it did to countless poor people around the globe, he did not have in mind US style capitalism. In response to some of these criticisms, and the Pope is often more than willing to take on board what these criticisms are and consider them and respond to them. In an interview in October 2014, he stated that fighting for the poor does not make him a communist, although he has previously praised the efforts of communists in fighting for the poor too. He said, I am not a follower of that ideology, but I know a lot of good that has come from people who have been followers of this. And of course, coming out of Latin America, He's not coming out of a post-Cold War mentality as well. Here we could say Pope Francis was somewhat paraphrasing the famous words of Dom Helder Camera, who once said, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Pope Francis seems to be clearly the Pope who has most clearly grasped the need to put the church's social mission to the forefront of its priorities above all else. And in this, he actually demonstrates he's a very traditional pope. For popes have been saying similar things about poverty, equality, and social justice for a very long time. The core centrality of Francis's commitment to the poor and social justice in his pontificate in general is perhaps something distinctive, and he's given these issues much needed new prominence and inspired debates and discussion worldwide. He's pushed them to the forefront of all the main departments of the Vatican and encourage dioceses throughout the world to do so as well. But in truth, the church has always been on the side of the poor, admittedly, sometimes fulfilling this mission more perfectly than at other times, but it's always had many uncomfortable truths for the sections of society that are fortunate enough to be privileged and wealthy, and yet who ignore the systemic causes of the injustices suffered by their brothers and sisters. This commitment to the poor, to equality, to building a just society as core principles are right there in the New Testament itself, in the Gospels, in the Acts of the Apostles, and the Epistles of Paul and the other New Testament writers. The commitment to building a just community with concern for the poor and less privileged, a commitment to sharing goods among the community so that those who have more give to those who have less, these permeate the New Testament, just as issues of justice permeate the Hebrew Bible, which Christians call the Old Testament too. Such, you could say, is among the most consistently taught doctrines of the church throughout history. The church's social teaching and social thought of practice have been more consistent, especially on these issues, than church teaching on so many other issues, including other moral issues. Long before the phrase option for the poor became so well known in the ecclesial discourse of the 1960s, a commitment brought to prominence thanks to the efforts of Popes John XXIII and Paul VI, further brought to prominence in the documents of Vatican II and give a further detailed articulation for contemporary times by the Synod of Bishops in their document, Justice in the World 1971, and also underpinned relentlessly in so many of the teaching documents from Pope John Paul II and from Benedict XVI, 
the option for the poor was there, inspiring and underneath many of the church's fundamental teachings. So in looking at Francis's vision, we are speaking about treasures old and new. In all, Francis is offering a very traditional social vision. Why can we say that? Because as Pope, as, as Pope Francis himself says, to say this again, this commitment to the poor and social justice, to transforming our societies for the better, so they are more just and egalitarian, so that love, charity, caritas, guides our interrelationships, lies at the very heart of the gospel itself. These principles have inspired the foundations and charisms of numerous religious orders right across history. Francis states that, to quote, God's heart has a special place for the poor, so much that he himself became poor, citing 2 Corinthians 8, 9. He says, the entire history of our redemption is marked by the presence of the poor. Such perspectives then, to an unflinching commitment on behalf of the poor and the excluded are among the most consistently taught doctrines of the church throughout history. And this is where genuine doctrinal continuity can truly be seen across recent decades, across centuries, across history. As Francis himself states, some may think the option for the poor a novelty, while instead it is a concern that stems from the gospel and is documented even from the first centuries of Christianity. If I repeated some passages from the homilies of the church fathers of the early Christian centuries in the second or third century about how we must treat the poor, some would accuse me of giving a Marxist homily. And he cites some of these homilies. You are not making a gift of what is yours to the poor man, but you are giving him back what is his. You have been appropriating things that are meant to be for the common use of everyone. The earth belongs to everyone, not to the rich. This isn't from a Marxist pamphlet in the 1960s. They were St. Ambrose's words, which Pope Paul VI used to state in Popularium Progressio, that private property does not constitute an absolute and unconditional right for anyone, and that no one is allowed to keep for their exclusive use things superfluous to their needs when others lack basic necessities. And again, he states, St. John Chrysostom said that not sharing your goods with the poor means robbing them and taking away their life. The goods we own are not ours, but theirs. And so he says, as we can see, this concern for the poor is in the gospel, within the tradition of the church. It is not an invention of communism, and it must not be turned into an ideology, as has sometimes happened before in the course of history. The church, when it invites us to overcome what he calls the globalization of indifference, is free from any political interest and any ideology. It is moved only by Jesus' words and wants to offer its contribution to build a world where we look after one another and care for each other. So, drawing to a close. Francis's vision is about a very definite bottom line, offering moral and social leadership for a world in need. Under Pope Francis, the church has increased its engagement in world affairs on multiple issues. The message from the church has been a courageous and uncompromising one. It's a message that makes world leaders, their aides, and many of the privileged and powerful uncomfortable. This is the precise point. This too carries on a long tradition in the history of the church. Recall how Francis has repeatedly stressed that faith and the gospel only exist to have practical outcomes. They are not there to serve simply pious and individual needs. Again, going back to his first major teaching document, he stated that no one can demand almost preempting the criticisms that he should stick to his area of business and stay out of other areas of business. No one can demand that religion should be relegated to the inner sanctum of personal life without influence on social and national life, without concern for the soundness of civil institutions, without a right to offer an opinion on events affecting society. An authentic faith, which is never comfortable or completely personal, always involves a deep desire to change the world, to transmit values, to leave this earth somehow better than we found it. We love this magnificent planet on which God has put us, and we love the human family which dwells here, with all its tragedies and struggles, its hopes and aspirations, its strengths and weaknesses. The earth is our common home, 
and all of us are brothers and sisters. And so he says, if indeed the just ordering of society and of the state is a central responsibility of politics, the church cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. All Christians, their pastors included, are called to show concern for the building of a better world. His holistic and integral vision was perhaps poignantly summed up when speaking to a gathering of children from different and multiple ethnic backgrounds who were visiting the Vatican on May the 12th in 2015 as part of a project called the Peace Factory. And I think there are probably a lot of uh, overlaps in the intentions of the Peace Factory with the L3 program here at Brescia as well. Pope Francis listened with great interest to their many questions. These young people had extremely intelligent and important questions to put to him. And in response to one child's huge question, in your opinion, will we all be equal one day? Pope Francis's response was equally profound. He said, we can answer this question in two ways. We are all equal, all of us, we are. But this truth is not recognized. This equality is not recognized. And for this reason, some people are, we can say, happier than others. But this is not a right. We all have the same rights. When we do not see this, society is unjust. It does not follow the rule of justice. And where there is no justice, there cannot be peace. I would like to repeat this with you, he says. Where there is no justice, there is no peace. And this echoes many of his predecessors in recent decades, but also is something he repeats in multiple ways. Elsewhere he states, peace in society cannot be understood as pacification or the mere absence of violence resulting from the domination of one part of society over others. Demands involving the distribution of wealth, concern for the poor and human rights cannot be suppressed under the guise of creating a consensus on paper or a transient peace for a contented minority. The dignity of the human person and the common good rank higher than the comfort of those who refuse to renounce their privileges. When these values are threatened, a prophetic voice must be raised. Indeed, he has repeated this again and again, echoing those immediate predecessors in Vatican II alike. Where there is no justice, there is no peace. When the common good and distributive justice are neglected, he says, violence results. So the message is clear, peace, harmony in our societies and world and social justice are inseparable. In Rome that day with those ethically diverse and very bright children, the, an audience of 7,000 people continued in a refrain repeating his final words, where there is no justice, there is no peace. A holistic vision for a just world indeed Francis's vision is set about making such a commitment, making this commitment for the church a steadfast reality across an ever-increasing areas of our societies, walking the most challenging walk. So in conclusion, there are ever new and ever worsening social challenges in our times, but so also is there a new energy and a new resolve across very different communities, religious and others alike, that a better world is possible. The crude economic, political, materialistic, and so social determinism of recent decades is slowly being shown up for the lie that it always was. And in, as increasing numbers of Catholics find renewed inspiration in the socially transformative power of the gospel once more, and they find collaborators in other churches, other faiths, and beyond particular faith communities who share such values, the coming decades could prove to be the most fruitful of all for the church's call to justice. So as said, and yet, in all, it's a very traditional social vision that shapes the revolution called for by Francis. And let us make no mistake, the changes to our world he is calling for are nothing short of revolutionary. And yet he also has spoken of the need for a revolution of tenderness. For Francis, love, charity, caritas, to use a Latin term for both, lies at the heart of the gospel. So this commitment to the poor, to social justice, 
lies at the heart of Pope Francis's vision of the church in general and everything else serves that priority because the gospel the good news of Jesus of Nazareth a vision grounded in radical love has that priority itself Francis tells us we must regain the conviction that we need one another that we have a shared responsibility for others and the world and that being good and decent are worth it this is a pope with an incredibly to cite his own words deep desire to change the world a pope whose faith is put into practice towards his ambition to most definitely leave this earth somehow better than he found it thank you Uh, Dr. Mannion has agreed to uh, take some questions. I've got a mic here, so if you want to raise your hand, I will come around uh, so everybody can hear your question. Uh, I'm going to get the ball rolling, not just because I have the mic, but because I heard Pope Francis take a pot shot at the theologians, and I feel the need <laughs> in the name of all theologians to push back on that a little bit. Um, it seems to me that that there needs to be an intimate relationship between the doctrinal life of the church and the pastoral life of the church, that a truly healthy pastoral life must be rooted in doctrine, and that a healthy doctrinal life must flow out into uh, a pastoral life. Uh, but what I heard here this evening is Pope Francis bifurcates the two and says, well, let's just ignore those theologians because they can't agree on anything till the day after the eschaton, and we're just going to focus on this other thing over here, the pastoral life of the church. Can you talk more about how Pope Francis envisions the relationship between the two? I mean, does he really bifurcate that, or am I no. oversimplifying I, it? I mean, that particular uh, point about the ecumenical dialogues, that anybody who's worked in ecumenism knows that um, the amount of trees that have been wasted thanks to multiple documents, which several decades later, people go back to the same issues and repeat some of the things people have said decades before without sometimes realizing they've already been said. What, of course he's making a rhetorical point and, uh, and a very important point a point which was often made by Pope John XXIII as well um, the key thing is to look at what Christians from different churches already share in common uh, the minutiae on particular interpretations of traditional doctrines or Eucharistic practice, ministerial uh, recognition and so on and so forth um, these he acknowledged were important discussions to have but in the meantime what Christians of different denominations already share in common, their commitment to Jesus, their commitment to the gospel, their baptism, for example, these are infinitely more important than the things that hold people back from full and visible unity. In a more general sense, so one of the things that refreshing about Pope Francis is that uh, he wasn't uh, a university professor, so, so to speak. He, he did teach in a seminary, but um, would not call himself a theologian. Yet there's a, there's a deep theological understanding and a historically informed understanding to all of his writings and what he talks about. You know, you look at his documents, again to take example the Evangelii Gaudium, he touches a lot of red button issues in ecclesiology there, for example, and deliberately so, but he doesn't say we cannot move forward and do anything until the last word has been said on these particular issues. And of course he knows this, he's been familiar with the workings of the church in Rome that sometimes scholars get in the way because the footnotes are more appealing to them than the actual reality that the footnotes are supposed to supplementary inform. So he has really encouraged a going back to a situation that existed for most of the history of the church, except in the relatively modern period. Um, let theological discourse flourish in a plurality of ways. Let the theological community have its discourse, have its debates. Um, Rome does not have to issue a final word on the details of those debates. And for much of the history of the church, Rome didn't. You know, you go back and there's instances where popes would, would consult in the medieval times the, the main universities of Europe on particular questions. And, it, and it's becoming more like those previous times. It's only really some time after the Council of Trent, and particularly in the 19th century, where things become more centralized on Rome. And of course, a pope coming from Buenos Aires is, is going to say that not everything has to be decided in Rome. And he said it, it would be it would not be healthy for the church if he decided every single question as it pertains to different contexts in different parts of the world. 
So he doesn't belittle theologians, and he actually enlists many in helping him, and frequently, apparently, his style of consultation is to telephone somebody personally, say, at one of the pontifical universities, and say, oh, come over, come over for lunch. I want to pick your brains on this or that or the other. You know, he consulted theologians widely, for example, on Laudato Si. Amoris Laetitia, obviously, uh, came out also of a much more back and forth, often heated series of exchanges among the bishops themselves at the Synod across two different years. But he, he knows what the theologians are saying, and he knows where those debates are going. But he also knows that if you wait until all of those questions have been resolved, then no progress can be made. And for him, the reason why, and theology, of course, the product of theology within Catholicism and often at an official level is doctrine. It, it informs the teaching of the church. It exists to serve that. It exists to make sense of faith and help people to understand faith. But of course, that in itself is to serve the practice of the faith and to put that faith into practice. It's not the other way around. So it, he's, I think he's got that relationship right. Instead of the, the doctrine dictates the practice in the church, the pastoral needs of the church of implementing the gospel should be able to dictate where theology is pointing its attention and therefore theology comes back to serving the faith rather than trying to simply determine what that faith is. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, Dr. Gerard, I, uh, I have a brother who uh, studied in the seminary for six years. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a very conservative Catholic, mm -hmm. and he believes that the Pope is a Marxist, and uh, all that he's said and all he's written, off, cuff, off the cuff remarks mm -hmm. and so forth, that he's dividing the church, not uniting it. Um, how I know, I know I can't convince him otherwise, but what would you have to say to him? And you know, to, yeah. Um, I mean, some of the things I was saying there in the last third of the paper, you know, that the, one, this isn't coming out of uh, the writings of Karl Marx, but there are things in the history of the church that resonate with many of the forms of social analysis and, and social critique that were in the writings of Marx. Um, Adolf Hitler called Marxism the illegitimate child of Christianity. Um, he didn't mean it as a compliment, but you, you could point towards it in some ways. And when you do look at the teachings of the early church fathers and mothers indeed as well, uh, which are lesser known, but the same vision is there, you see a radical social vision. And particularly on issues of private property and the redistribution of wealth. You know, it's right there in the Acts of the Apostles 2.2, the, the early church at its very beginnings divide up their goods and share them amongst everybody, each according to his needs and her needs. So. To call Pope Francis a Marxist, and one has to say it's only in certain countries he's getting that critique, but uh, of course uh, many countries did not have this, this binary oppositional Manichaean relationship towards socialism and Marxism that of course has in influenced much US discourse in recent decades. Uh, in Latin America there were lots of Marxists, there were lots of more open debates about what's wrong with their societies, they went through dictatorships, they went through horrendous periods of inequality before those dictatorships. Um, it's, it's not seen as a dirty word in many parts of the world. And so Francis is fairly sanguine about just saying, well, you know, it's no big deal if you think this is Marxist. It's not, he says. You know, I don't follow that particular political persuasion and ideology. But if there's something that actually chimes in with the church's own teaching, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I think there's been a period in recent history where in some countries, including the US, maybe especially, and not just in Catholicism, people have lost the sight of where the distinction between their faith and their politics comes. That there's a blurring of the distinction, and so that the political becomes the religious, and the religious becomes the political. And sometimes people are forgetting, and in one sense they're interpreting their faith because they want it to mirror their political leanings and they should be allowing their faith instead to shape their political leanings. And I think we're, we've, we've lost sight of that in recent decades in many ways. Uh, you know, Dr. Mangrum, kind of, I guess, more of a commentary than a question, but 
uh, understanding the, the readings we've been having uh, at mass in the mornings lately, you know, uh, Samuel through Kings and all of this we see you know, way before Marx was ever mm -hmm. thought of. Uh, I, I was glad you brought out Acts, finally. I, uh, I've always wondered how people could talk about what Fr Pope Francis has been saying without referring back to the prophets and also Luke Acts, because the prophets with their uh, understanding of, of justice and righteousness is the only way to peace, and also Luke and Acts, uh, talking about toppling the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly, and this, this whole um, uh, just turning everything upside down, you know, and, and to me, when I've seen, listened to Francis, it seems like he has those as his primary sources, whether he actually quotes them or not. I, I, just like to hear more. Sure, of course he does, and it's it's because again in in, the, in Latin America when liberation theology was flourishing and in Argentina it developed in a, in a particularly distinctive way, but not in such a distinctive way that it was as different from the other parts of Latin America as some commentators have tried to make out. Um, they would set up local Bible groups in in the local communities where they would look at the Bible and they'd see the Bible as a living text and say, what does the Bible say to us today? How does it reflect? Uh, you know, the challenges that we're faced with today. And, and some of the, the, say, poor fishermen and their families, um, their reflections on the Bible have been gathered into into books and published since because there's a profound theology going there. The, the Latin American Lib liberation theologian says uh, that everyone is a theologian because you're, you're reflecting on faith and life, using the faith to reflect on life. Francis sees this because the, the Bible is a political text. It's charged with political and social imperatives. It's born out of people bearing witness to a faith but also living through struggles and determining what does their faith say to them in the midst of those struggles. Where do they gain hope from? Where do they gain guidance from? And it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a document written across a long, long period of history, multiple different communities. But if anything's consistent, it's on the social and the political. And the faith cannot be divorced from this. There have been churches and there have been some in the Catholic Church who try to divorce faith and politics but you know you go back to the, the ancient Greece you know you know political and social thought often in, in universities you know people think these are different things social sciences and political sciences yet the polis um, the original term is, is it's the community it's the city um, so when you're talking about politics you're talking about social life that's what it refers to and we cannot compartmentalize these and I think if people of faith communities try to keep it separate then they're missing something that's there in their faith they're, they're forgetting the prophets they're forgetting Acts they're forgetting Luke they're forgetting Paul you know they're forgetting the Gospels themselves and I think it's hugely important that, that we remember that and we don't just many people do but want to read into the Bible what we want to see there you know let the Bible say what it will say yeah eisegesis not exegesis you know, take out of the Bible what it's saying and sometimes what is it saying to our time and of course that's a practice in the early church as well you know biblical fundamentalism is a relatively modern phenomenon you know the early church fathers would have been horrified that people were taking everything in the bible literally that doesn't mean that not everything in the bible has something to say to a contemporary situation and of course there were very sophisticated forms of biblical interpretation they developed to distinguish between these so i'd say yeah he's he's consciously aware of this i mean one of the reasons he keeps many of us who are watching him so busy is because every day he preaches and he reflects on the readings of that day and you know early on people were reading everything he said and then they realized we just can't keep up with everything he says you know he's, so he's letting the bible inform his thinking and then something he might say in a homily will then later on appear in a much more important context as well I'm going to get out of student questions. You're starting to sound like my students now. Oh, okay, we've got a question <laughs> over here. Yeah, maybe they just want the uh, reception. Won't be long, I promise. Uh, part of your, pre in your presentation, you were talking about a prophetic voice must be raised, you know? Yeah. This is a, a very difficult time. When I was a student back in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, um, we had a group called Just Faith. Mm -hmm. And so many of the issues that were, should have been just front and center of the church's teaching and of our 
uh, shared responsibility of our option for the poor. Um, it's like we, we were like those visionaries that wanted then what we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. And I find it very precarious where we find ourselves as Catholics in the American church. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, people say you can't talk politics and religion in the same sentence, you know, in the same gathering. You should not ever do that. But it's so, I mean, how can you look at what's going on today when tax cuts are being given mm -hmm. to the wealthiest in corporations? And like Pfizer today, where it was uh, announced that in spite, in, 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 um, in spite of the billions of dollars they're making, they are re they are removing um, the research for these dangerous uh, sprays that are going to be on our fruits and vegetables. Well, how how do we get that prophetic voice out? Can you come to all of our parishes and let us know? No, I'm serious because people don't hear this yeah. from our our pastors. It's almost like. You know, we don't go there. But for a lot of Catholics, the only way they vote, the way they make their decision, is it's an abortion issue. You know, but it has to be more than that. I mean, maybe I'm the wrong person. No, 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 not on at all. And, uh, and I wish, you know, all the parishes in your diocese could hear what you just said. Um, there are different times in the history of the church, in different places, not just the US, where people are afraid to confront the received wisdom or what is accepted as, as just the way things are and are going to be. And, um, you know, sociologists will tell you that Catholics are just as susceptible to turning tides of political opinion and fortunes as anybody else. Um, happily, at many other times, Catholics and people of other faith groups will allow their faith to inform their decisions when it comes to voting, when it comes to speaking out, when it comes to protesting, when it comes to not tolerating things that are clearly contrary to what their faith has taught them. And I think there are periods of history where there's a groundswell of energy that comes to the fore, and I think the post-Vatican II church, the late 60s, the early 70s, into the 80s, was one of those periods. Uh, one of the problematic things that happens, of course, is in the midst of the 90s, there's, there's a clamping down on the theology of liberation, there's a particular new interpretation of how the church should not become too embroiled in the political. You know, you can you can practice liberation theology in Poland, but you can't do it in Latin America. You know, it's how it should not be able to, you know, that sometimes people were confusing the faith with politics in another way, over to the left, so on and so forth. That took some of the wind out of the sails of that energy, and I think all those dynamic groups who had set up and lots of the initiatives from religious orders and diocesan and parish groups and began to wane. The, the, the real dynamism of the justice and peace networks in dioceses, for example, began to wane in the late 80s and 90s. And it ran out of steam and people saw it as becoming too polarizing. And so instead of talking about social justice, um, people began to talk about things such as abortion uh, because um, that may have been seen as less polarizing than politics. And of course, these, these red lines in the sand, these were not always red lines in the sand for Catholic discussions. So I think the key is we might be coming to a new era where these questions are coming to the forefront again. Um, it's not that you know, m most recent popes before Francis were not talking about social questions, they were, but the headlines they were generating were more doctrinal questions, moral questions of a different nature, more sexual and relationship nature. Um, and therefore, the very powerful social messages they were mentioning were getting lost. Francis has, has put other questions into the background while he pushes the most urgent questions to the forefront. And this is because he's the first pope who wasn't at Vatican II in recent times. Um, he wasn't quite ordained then. He's also formed by Vatican II. He's formed by his Latin American context. He's seen the abject poverty at first hand and worked amongst it. And so his ministry really is geared towards trying to encourage the church to become brave again in its commitment and steadfast in its commitment to the poor. And as I say, he's leading by example. And I think what the church hopefully will be going through in the next few decades will be a, a process of reconscientiation 
you know, making people aware again that here are the implications of the gospel for our societies, and therefore, what can we collectively do about this? And what's distinctive in particular about Francis is he's also reaching out to other churches and other faith groups and saying, let's work together on this. You know, most recently, uh, he just spoke about something about human trafficking, about collaboration for that once more, which he's been very dedicated to with leaders from other faith communities. And I think, I mean, I've said to recently to, a co to colleagues a couple of times, wouldn't it be a very depressing world right now if Pope Francis wasn't Pope? You know, he's a voice of, of reason, of compassion, sometimes of sanity, uh, in a world where, in many parts of the world, politics is being driven to the extremes and therefore his his voice is you know whatever part of the church you come from in, in recent memory sometimes if a pope spoke many catholics would switch off they would not listen and yet when pope francis speaks the whole world listens not everyone will agree with him but a lot of people agree with him uh, in dc when i'm traveling to dulles airport um, more often than not the cab driver will be muslim and when they ask me what I do for a living and I say they want to talk about Pope Francis and say don't you just love Pope Francis we love him I love Pope Francis isn't he a great man isn't he a good man and I think you see that transcending of differences and saying what's what's our common aims and Francis is shifting the the, the focus back to solidarity and the common good and I think we'll see you know people spoke about liberation theology as being passe and finished you know with the fall of Marxism and so on and so forth well there, there were no Marxists in the 19th century so to speak the 20th century was a, a century when that came to the fore but separating that from liberation theology because if you look at the footnotes of the classic liberation theo theologians Marx isn't mentioned very often at all um, the Bible is mentioned very often um, the 21st century could be a time when the church's social mission makes its greatest impact on the on the globe and i think it's coming center stage and it's there throughout all of francis's particular um teachings and let's not forget i didn't have space really to talk much about this today but amoris Laetitia, you know the, the document after the synod on the bishops about human love and families and relationships that is written by francis also as a social document it's not a document about what's right and wrong in the relationships between people. It's not a document about how people can be excluded from the sacraments or not. It's a document about what is best for our societies, what is best for our families. What does the gospel tell us to implement our teachings along these lines, to show compassion, to show inclusion, to show love? And I think, I think this is something you know that's been missing for a while as well. So I've, when you think about it, you know, next month, Pope Francis will have been Pope for just five years. And look at how things have changed already just in those five years, not just within the church, but within the world, uh, the difference it's making. So, uh, you know, when you have the Vatican as a key player at the United Nations to try to bring about a commitment to end nuclear weapons, and people are listening. When you have the Pope uh, bartering really to have the impasse between the US and Cuba ended. The second time a pope has done that in, in recent history, if the 60s can be, still be included in recent history. You know, the, this is somebody everyone is listening to. Not every political leader wants to listen to him, but his vision is appealing. And if you look at the, the studies of social values in many countries, the values of younger generations today are moving more in the direction of what Francis sees as priorities than in other directions. And that can only be a good thing. Before we adjourn tonight to the uh, Moore Center, it's the building immediately uh, adjacent here. Again, please come join us for refreshments. We can continue this conversation. You can get a look at our new uh, rehabilitated uh, center. Uh, before we do that, uh, Father Larry wanted to say a word. Thank you, Stuart. I just wanted to offer my own thanks to the organizers of this evening, Dr. Squires and uh, Dr. Demore, where did Emily go? Um, it's right back there. Uh, for doing such a great job getting this organized. Thanks to all of you for coming out this evening and being part of this. And in a very special way, Dr. Mandy, thank you for this very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, as you may know, uh, Brescia University for the last two years has begun to reflect on the question of caritas and love. And what does that mean for us um, as an institution, uh, as a, a 
Catholic institution uh, in the Ursuline tradition. Um, and we have really come to an understanding that if we're going to be a Catholic institution, we have to take very seriously the command of Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. So how do we get our students through four years of, of a university education to where that has becomes part of the outcomes of, of education? So your uh, presentation this evening is very relevant, not only in the global sense that uh, we've heard uh, this evening, but also the very particular sense of what we are trying to do here. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Let's uh, give them another round of applause, please. And let's go enjoy those cannolis. <laughs>